Today, I am here to talk to you about God's favor. As you can tell, I am not Pastor Dwight, I'm Prescott. I was telling somebody earlier this week that we're taking a commercial break in the Joshua Fit the Battle of Jericho series, and we're talking today about favor. Favor. And the reason why is because I have been trying to understand the concept of God's favor in circumstances that don't feel very favorable. Understanding God's favor when you don't feel like you're being favored. At the end of last year, at the end of last year, the journey for this sermon began because our pioneer senior staff team was going to meet for a year-end close-out-the-year Vespers. It was going to be on Zoom, and we were going to take some time to think and to pray beforehand about what we wanted our one-word prayer for the new year to be. Because at this meeting, what we were going to do, we were going to give thanks and praise God for another year that we were able to complete, and then we were going to refocus to pray and to ask God, where do you want us to go for this coming year? And so, our one word prayer was what we were going to use to capture our hopes, our dreams, and our prayers for the year. And so, when I got the calendar invite in early December, I did what most of you would do. I accepted it, I put it in the calendar, and then I forgot about it for three weeks. The weeks were filled with planning, they were filled with student meetings, they were filled with end-of-the-year programs, they were filled with budget cycles, and most importantly, they were filled with lots and lots of preparation for the birth of our daughter, Eliza. I got very good in those three weeks, I got very good at putting together furniture that I'm convinced engineers had purposefully designed to frustrate expecting parents because there was too few screws, too many washers, and not enough holes for everything to go together. I was busy. Those three weeks were very busy. But what I didn't do during that busyness was any meaningful preparation for our team's vespers. That was until an hour before our team's vespers. And it was then, running on three hours of sleep with a newborn, I went and did a last-minute holy Google search where I typed in Bible verses that will preach. And I'll tell you, as we learned in our children's story, if God can use a donkey to talk to Balaam, and he can use a fish to get Jonah's attention, He can use an internet search engine to help a procrastinating pastor find a verse to share with the team. The verse. The verse is what we read for our scripture reading earlier. The verse that the Holy Spirit through Google helped me find was Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2. And it reads, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor And he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all those that mourn. But it was the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor. Somewhere deep inside of my soul, that phrase, the year of the Lord's favor, resonated. And it resonated because at that moment, I didn't feel very favored. At that moment, I didn't feel favor at all. Because Carissa and I were in the middle of a perfect storm of bad circumstances that left us exhausted. We didn't feel favored. Yes, our daughter Eliza, our promised child, was born, and we were ecstatic, and still are ecstatic. But soon after she arrived, there were emergency medical readmits to the hospital for my wife. And then there were struggles to ensure that our little girl was gaining weight and thriving. And then not only that, while we were fighting those battles, our one car broke down in the middle of a Michigan snowstorm just as the hospital bills started coming in. And as you know, hospital bills like to come in. It was one of those moments where I didn't feel favored because the nights were short, the days were long, and the stressors were as high as a mountain. I felt frustrated. I felt forgotten. I didn't feel favored. I felt tired. I was having a really hard time finding the favor of God in the middle of the fury of my circumstances. 
but favor resonated nonetheless. Favor resonated, and that's where the study began of the word. It began right there in that moment. I became fascinated with favor because even in the middle of the mess, I still felt as if God's presence was there. I still felt that God was there wanting us to learn something, to grow some, somehow, to teach us something. I still felt God was there someplace. And it's there that the sermon, this sermon was, began. It began from the experience and it came into the study. And from there, it's the start of a book topic that hopefully one day will be on the shelves if I finish the manuscript. But the reason I'm sharing it with you, the reason I'm sharing what the one word prayer was and now this topic on favor with you is because I have a feeling there are those of you in the congregation today that would feel similar. You might feel similar to how I felt. You might be asking the same questions about favor and how that works in your life because you don't feel favored. Favor. It's a word you and I don't use that often. It's an old, old word. It's an old word that we don't use in our modern day language, but I think if there is ever a time to resurrect that old word, it's now. I think if there's ever a time to resurrect it, it's because after two and a half years of crazy change, I can only imagine you feel a lot like Isaiah 61. I don't think I have to explain to you what it feels like to have experienced poor in spirit, to be poor in spirit. Because you've experienced having your once vibrant spirit crushed from the weight of expectations and circumstances that were far beyond your control. I don't think I have to explain or let you know what being brokenhearted feels like. Because I think you've experienced it because loss has come to define your story. Because even though there was one disease that was talked about, other diseases like cancer and dementia, suicide and depression, old age and tragic accidents, those things didn't go away. They just got pushed out of the spotlight. You still suffered with them, just in silence. And I don't think I have to talk about or explain to you what it means to be a captive or to be a prisoner in spiritual darkness or any type of darkness. Because no matter how hard you try to escape, it feels like you just can't. That that tailor-made sin just gets a grip on you. And no matter how far you run, how long you feel freedom, it just seems to reel you back in and pull you down into that darkness and never let you go. I don't think I have to explain any of that because Isaiah 61 would resonate with you. But the year of the Lord's favor. God's favor is an antidote to the realities that we just talked about. It's an antidote to the reality of being poor in spirit. It's an antidote to the reality of being brokenhearted. It's an antidote to the reality of feeling like a prisoner and a spiritual captive in darkness. God's favor is entirely unlike anything you have ever experienced. It's entirely new and different because God's favor is a royal mixture of grace, blessings, and acceptance that is so much more than anything you can ever have imagined. Favor is the freedom you've been looking for. <coughs> favor is the hope that you have long, lo, lo, long let go of. Favor is the peace for the swirling storm inside your brain and the chaotic circumstances around your life. Favor is the acceptance from God the Father you have been longing for all your life. Favor is the peace from the raging storm, but it's also the joy that springs up after tragedy and it's the gratitude that overwhelms that fear of loss. Favor is the wonder that makes you sit back and ask, what else can God do in my life? But favor is also the faith that gives you meaning when the world is meaningless. But today, I doubt many of you would say, my life looks like that picture of favor. I doubt today that many of you would say, the circumstances around me scream that I am being favored by God. Rather, I'm pretty sure most of you would say my circumstances are just screaming. I don't think many of us are feeling that favor right now in this moment. And if that's you, if that's you, if you resonate with that, if you say somewhere deep inside my soul, I resonate with that feeling right there, I think then Mary's story is the story that you need to hear today. Mary's story is in the Bible in Luke chapter 1. So grab your Bibles. It's going to be on the screen, but grab your Bibles too. 
even if it's just to prove that you have it with you. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, Mary's story doesn't take up much space in the Bible. In fact, Mary's story is only in part of Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 has most of Elizabeth's story. Elizabeth has the miraculous conception and birth of John the Baptist and the story of her husband Zechariah in the temple. And he goes mute because he doesn't believe the angel. And then John is born and they write down his name. But then after that story, there's the story of Mary. And not much space is given to Mary, but Mary is here and the text opens up in no good Nazareth. No good Nazareth, right? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? The answer is always no, right? But Mary is here in no good Nazareth and she's young and she's engaged. Mary is looking forward to the future. Things are going well for Mary. She has hope on the horizon. She has, she's doing everything right in no good Nazareth because she's going to be one of the few success stories that comes out of this town. She's doing everything right. And for her life, there's promise and there's hope and there's a future. And all of a sudden, an angel shows up and here's what it says. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And pause right here. Because not only is Mary doing everything right, not only does she have a great future ahead of her, she's marrying into the line of David. And so for a Jewish person, this is like the best thing that you could ever do. David was the loved king of Israel. This is, this is like, this is royalty, quite literally royalty in the line of David. She's doing everything right. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. But Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered, What kind of greeting might this be? What kind of greeting is this? And I love it. I love it. Because here, Gabriel the angel shows up to talk to Mary and say, You are highly favored. And we just talked about favor being a mixture of grace, blessings, and acceptance. And Gabriel comes and says, not only, Mary, are you favored, but you are highly favored. The Lord looks at you with favor. And then you see her reaction. You see her reaction. The text tells me that Mary was greatly troubled at his words. And she wondered, what kind of greeting might this be? In that moment, Mary didn't feel favored. Mary didn't feel blessed. Mary didn't feel very gracious and she didn't feel very accepted. Mary felt troubled. She felt troubled, like deep inside of her soul troubled. Like, have you ever been walking in a dark building by yourself at night and you think that something bad might happen to you but you know no one else is there? but you still keep checking over your shoulder because you're like, something, it just doesn't feel quite right. And so you walk a little faster, but you tell yourself not to run because you're a brave person, but you still feel troubled deep in your soul. Like it's that type of trouble that Mary feels right now. She feels troubled. The angel comes and gives her a promise, but instead of the promise giving her hope, the promise gives her trouble because she knew that the promise would give her trouble. Do you catch that? She was troubled because she knew she was about to be troubled. And the reason why is because Mary didn't come to this text. Mary didn't come to this word with the concept of a modern televangelist that says you're going to have a mansion on a hill and everything's going to be fine and God just wants to bless you with every prosperity gift that you can. Mary didn't come with that mindset to the text or to the word favored. Mary was a good Jewish girl who was doing everything the right way. And she knew, she knew from years of stories that no person in Bible history has ever had it easy after God said they were favored. It's never a thing. Take a look. Genesis 4 says that Abel found favor in the eyes of the Lord when he brought a sacrifice of a lamb, whereas his brother Cain brought a sacrifice of a salad, and then Cain got angry and killed Abel outside in a field as the first premeditated murder of a martyr. But then there was Noah, Noah found, eyes in the Lord, found favor in the eyes of the Lord in Genesis 6, verse 8, when God saw that the world had become too wicked to redeem, and so Noah was sent to build a boat, and so he built a boat in the middle of the dry land. And for 120 years, everyone mocked him and made fun of him. He became a social outcast because he was talking about a giant shift in the world that had never happened before, that they had never seen. But then to get worse, all the animals of the world, including the frogs, I'm sorry, all the animals of the world came and decided to live in his houseboat. But then... There's Abraham. 
Abraham finds the highest form of favor in a special blessing in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 that says that all the descendants of his will increase and all the nations of the world will be blessed. And that includes you and me right here today. But then Abraham experiences the worst of midlife or old life crises because this guy was old. He has an old life crisis. And instead of buying the Old Testament equivalent of a sports car, like an Arabian racing camel or something, instead of that, he starts a wandering journey where he leaves his home, he leaves his status, he leaves all that he ever knew. He leaves his respected community where he was a member of and he wanders. And even though he was rich, he has to rely on the generosity and goodness of other people. But then it doesn't stop. In 1 Samuel, Hannah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. She had finally gotten her promised child in Samuel. But then as soon as Samuel was weaned, he went to live with the priests at the temple and he went away from his family. Samuel and Hannah only see each other once a year because the text tells us she would go to the temple to bring him new clothes. But the Bible also tells us that Hannah's womb was opened and not only did she have Samuel, but she had other children. And so the family grew and grew and grew. And so when Hannah and the family would come up to the temple, I'm sure Samuel would see his, other fam- his family and the other kids, and he would wonder why he was the one that got sent away. The story of Job, it doesn't use the word favor, but Job was blameless in the eyes of the Lord. And then he lost everything except for his wife and his friends who told him that it was all his fault and that he should just stop and die. What makes it worse is that you and I get to see behind the scenes, but Job never gets the answers to his questions. He doesn't know why. All he knows is that he loses everyone except for his wife and friends who are telling him to die. But then there's finally Daniel. Daniel, this guy was highly esteemed and favored in the eyes of the Lord. But his journey was anything but easy. He was forcefully relocated, had at least three death sentences on his life, and he spent the night in a lion's den, but it was unlike the lion's den you see in the Sabbath school classroom where they're all cuddly and cute and your kids can sit on them and take photos. These are the type of lions that will rip your arms off at night because they're hungry. And he spends the night in this lion's den because of professional jealousy, political turmoil, and the spiritual oppression of the enemy. Are you seeing the pattern here? When Gabriel comes to Mary and says, you are highly favored. Her mind, trained from years of going to Sabbath school, church schools, and pathfinders, immediately would have been shouting out, I don't want to be favored. I want to be the most unfavored person that this world has ever seen. Because the minute someone's favored, there's no obvious benefits, and their life circumstances suddenly become difficult. Do you resonate with that? And I think that's the whole point of this sermon. That's the whole point of this sermon. The whole point is that the life of favor isn't dependent on the tangible blessings you might receive. Being favored in the eyes of the Lord isn't dependent on your social status. Favor isn't suddenly finding financial success or having your retirement nest egg that you've worked so hard for. Favor isn't even being well-liked or attractive. Favor doesn't mean that you can suddenly have the kids that you couldn't have before you were favored by God. Because favor doesn't work that way. The Bible heroes we mentioned, the Bible heroes we mentioned were favored because God had an extra special purpose in store for them. An extra special purpose in store for them that would require an extra special level of dependence on him because God was giving them the reassurance that they could depend on him because his presence would be with them. Finding favor, finding favor in the eyes of the Lord doesn't guarantee you extra special prosperity. Finding favor in the eyes of the Lord does not guarantee you any sort of material, tangible blessing that you so desperately want. Some people, like Abraham, they got that stuff. But God was also giving them the greatest of blessings, the greatest blessing of himself. The favor, the favor which brings hope, healing, and peace is found in the presence of God and it's independent. It is independent of any tangible blessings or circumstances in your life. Those two, you don't always see them at the same time. You don't look for the blessings and say, I'm favored. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. 
to answer the question, how do I find favor in the eyes of the Lord? How do I find it? What does it look like? How do I find this favor? And the short answer, this is the, uh, this is the Cliff Notes like end, end, uh, end story recap here. So for those people like me that have to know what happens before it happens, so you read the end of the synopsis of the story, so you're not surprised because I hate surprises, so if I get a book, I'm going to read the end before I, I read the book. If you're like me, the short answer here to how do you find favor is that it's found in the presence of God. Favor is found in the presence of God. And there are some of you who are listening here today and you're nodding along and smiling as if you fully agree, but inside you're terrified because this means that you'll have to change the way you interact with God. Because you know that there are some people in this congregation, some people that are listening that want the blessings of the baby or they want the favor of the future with the fantastic finances or they want the security of a spouse or they want the freedom from the sinful habits And you might want all of these things and more, but you might not want the favor or the, sorry, the presence of God because the presence of God demands something of your life. The presence of God demands all of you. It asks for all of you and then some. The presence of God says, once I'm in your life, things are different because the presence of God will take away your focus from you and it will will put your focus directly on God because no longer are you the center of your world, God becomes the center of your world. The presence of God changes how you see yourself but also changes how you see your career, it changes how you see your family, it changes how you see your future and it changes these things and it might be scary because just as we saw with all the biblical heroes, it might not be as comfortable or as safe as you would like. But the favor of God is always found in the presence of God. So I say this lightly, because I know this might not be the case for everyone in this room, but it might be the case for someone in this room, is that if you're not feeling the favor of God, maybe it is, just maybe, that you need to step into his presence because you've been living outside of his presence for far too long. So if you're worried about not feeling God's presence, it might need to be, it might need to be that you, you have to step into his presence. You have to actually turn around and go to him. But I'll tell you, the presence of God in your life doesn't come just because you sit on, in church on sa- Saturday. It doesn't show up because you go to every prayer meeting or evangelistic series or every Sabbath school that exists. The presence of God doesn't appear because you go to every satellite whenever they have it. The presence of God doesn't come because you always go to youth group and you sing the songs and you feel good. The presence of God doesn't even come because you signed up to be a deacon or a teacher or a greeter or an elder or a worship leader in the church, which those are all really good things. So when the volunteer engagement committee calls you, please say yes to them. And the presence of God certainly isn't found in whatever you're doing at 2 a.m. that you think no one else knows that you're doing, but everyone else knows that you're doing it because it's Berrien Springs and everybody knows everything that goes on. The presence of God doesn't even come from talking about God. The presence of God comes from being with God. The presence of God comes from being with God, from living a life with God. Not taking orders from God, not doing everything because you have to please God, not feeling like you have to invite God in to bless your business. No, no, no. Those are all different ways of interacting. Being with God says that you're a part of my life and I want to be a part of your future. It says, being with God says, I'm going to live the Romans 12 out where my life is a living sacrifice, where I invite you in to everything that I do, and I consult you so much that I know what you're going to tell me because I hear you telling me what to do, and so I live my life because I'm living it with you, and everything I do becomes an act of worship because you're with me, and I'm with you. The presence of God comes from being with God. And so if you want his favor, live in his presence because favor is always found in the presence of God and nowhere else. It's connecting to God. Mary's life was about to change. Mary's life was about to change. This good Jewish girl who had done everything the right way was about to have her reputation trashed. 
where she would walk through the market and people would start to whisper that she was the girl that did that thing that you're not supposed to do until you're married and now she's suffering the consequences of it. And everyone would talk about her. It was hard enough just being a woman in that time period. Now she was suffering from a story that she couldn't explain to anyone and nobody would believe her. Mary had the great plans for her future trashed. Her future to be honored and respected in her community, to be the success story of Nazareth, of no good Nazareth, was suddenly gone. And Gabriel saw Mary's justified fear that she was troubled. Gabriel sees this, and this is what Gabriel responds. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And that's like the least empathetic thing you could say in that situation, right? She's fearful and he says, stop it. But he goes on. He goes on and says this. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you're to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants or Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Gabriel's response. Gabriel's response doesn't say, sorry, your plans have just been wrecked. He doesn't say that. And he doesn't say that Mary's life circumstances would change for the better. He doesn't say that. But what he does say, what Gabriel does say, what Gabriel promises, what Gabriel promises not just to her, but to you too, is that God's presence is not only with you, but it's literally living inside of you. And so that every step of the way, God will be with you. Oh, and that guy you were going to marry, who was the great, 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 great grandson of David, distantly re related? Yeah. That's not the status symbol you're going to claim anymore because the child inside of you is the son of the most high who's going to sit on David's throne. And not only that, but he's the king of kings. He's not just any king. He's the king of kings, the king of kings who actually made David. No longer was she going to have a distant connection to royalty. She was going to have royalty at arm's reach at all times because the God of the universe was going to have his presence with her. Highly favored. The year of the Lord's favor. I think the lesson here for the sermon, the main lesson to take away is that there's no material blessings you're going to carry with you. There's no instant fame or fortune that's guaranteed to you. You may never receive the good, easy life that you've worked so hard for all these years, but what is guaranteed to you is that when you step into the life of favor, the presence of the omnipotent, omniscient, all-caring, all-devoted blesser, King of kings, Son of the Most High, who created everything will go with you every step of the way. That is guaranteed. Because the favor of God isn't a promise about feeling fantastic. It's a promise that while you live your God-breathed purpose, that the King of Kings will be your intimate friend. It's the promise that gives birth to Psalms 23, where David says all the material blessings that you and I learned, Psalms 23, when we were younger. And it says being led by still waters, that's a material blessing. Being anointed in front of my enemies, being protected in the valley of the shadow of death, being restored and rescued when I go astray. All of those things are great, David says. But the real blessing is at the end of Psalms 23 in verse 6, when David says that not only well, surely, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, but I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm just going to be with God. I'm going to be with God. I'm going to live in his presence because all of those blessings are great, but that's not what matters. It doesn't matter that I'm anointed in front of my enemies. It doesn't matter that he protects me in the valley of the shadow of death when things are crazy and there's chaotic darkness. It doesn't matter that he restores my soul beside the still waters when the raging storm is still going on inside of me. It doesn't matter because of all that, those things. It matters because in the house of the Lord, when I live there, there is his presence. Because I don't need those tangible things in the middle of my circumstances. Our circumstances didn't change just because we felt the presence of God in the middle of our storm. In fact, we ended up having more additional difficulties. 
We tried renting a car at a time where car rentals were scarce. We needed to make repairs to our car, but it turned out that the only place to get it repaired was down in South Bend. So we had to have it towed to South Bend, but South Bend couldn't fix it there, so they had to tow it to Elkhart. And then in Elkhart, we realized that tow trucks like to charge at like $100 every half hour. But in Elkhart, it was the middle of a snowstorm, so we couldn't actually get the car towed back. They had to specially hire a service tech to drive it from Elkhart back to, back to South Bend. And there in South Bend, we had to figure out a way to get a couple friends to relay us down to the car to pick it up and drive it back here, all in the middle of a snowstorm. Yeah, we had additional issues. But what we did realize, what we did realize was that in the middle of the difficulties, God was good. And we saw the presence and the goodness of God come through family members who stepped in when we were worn thin. And then we saw the goodness of God through church members and our church family. That's you guys right now. We saw it when there was a meal train that came through to deliver meals every day for our meals to take the additional burden off of us. And I'll tell you, we learned that some of you can really cook. It was good, so thank you. We saw the goodness of God come through a discount code a friend got us for a rental car that helped us get through the gap when nothing else worked. But most of all, we learned that we could be favored without having to focus on the material, tangible blessings that we'd come to expect. Because the favor of God always comes from his presence and it's independent of everything else. And so today, today, in this moment, after we've heard my story, a little bit of it, and after we've seen what favor looks like in the Bible, a little of that, after we've gone through here, what is the takeaway? What do we do? What do we do after this? And this is the takeaway I want for you. The takeaway today is I want you to take a different picture of God's favor with you. One that says, I don't care about the material blessings that come my way. I just want the blesser. But more importantly, what I want you to do is I want you to spend meaningful time with God. I want you to feel inspired to do this. So that when you sit down today to eat your special K-loaf with all of your family, I want you to sit down and say, we need to start having family worship. Because I feel the need to spend time as a family in the presence of God. What I want you to do is after this sermon, I want you to feel the need to pray a prayer of blessing over your kids. To pray for their success and their favor with God. Because you want them to live in the presence of God and grow up in the presence of God. I want you to go away from this. And in the middle of your worst defeats, I want you to raise a hallelujah as you're suffering with illness and disease because the diagnosis doesn't define you and the prognosis isn't necessarily the plan of God. The presence of God is what matters in that situation. And so in the middle of it, when you don't know what's gonna happen, raise a hallelujah. I want you to say as God is there with you that no matter what else happens in my life, I am okay because I have the blesser. I have God. I want you to walk away from this sermon and I want you to worship. I want you to choose to worship and feel the need to worship God because everything you do day in and day out with God is an act of worship so you can praise him and glorify him all the day long. And what I want you to do, most importantly, most importantly, there's no connect card today because I don't need you to connect with me or with a program or anything else, what I want for you today is to follow up and connect with God. To dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want you to take meaningful time to sit and dwell in his presence so that you can be reminded as the circumstances swirl around you that God's favor is independent of those things and it's only found in him. So that you can say, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.